Uh, good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be here today at the University of Chicago to celebrate the 125th anniversary and to tell you briefly uh, about my research. And I need to get the way to change these slides. Um, so, um, okay, so uh, science that matters to anyone driven by the curiosity to understand how our world uh, works is the type of awe-inspiring science that we do at Fermilab in partnership with the University of Chicago and also with Argon. Uh, I have vivid in my mind the image of uh, kids um, staring uh, at the grandness of our universe. Um, I grew up uh, in one of the most southern countries of the planet, in Argentina, and uh, uh, every summer I could go to the countryside, to the Argentinian Pampas, and uh, there in the deep darkness of the night, uh, my cousins and I would sit uh, exactly like these kids and uh, would be amazed by the stars. And we were about six years old, so uh, we knew basically nothing about the science behind these stars, but it was really breathtaking. Uh, today, uh, as a scientist, uh, and most of my adult life, I have had the pleasure or the privilege uh, to be thinking about the big mysteries of particle physics. So uh, what causes the particles like the quarks and the electrons that everything is made of uh, to, become, to be massive and to slow uh, from uh, moving at the speed of light? Uh, if they were moving at the speed of light, the universe the way we know it today uh, would not exist. The Higgs boson is at the core of all of it, and uh, here we see actually a Higgs boson transforming into uh, two particles of light, two photons. Um, so, uh, what holds the universe together and produce uh, these uh, distorted images of the distant galaxies? We call it dark matter, and we don't have a clue what it is. Um, next, uh, Nigel already talked about this. I mean, the neutrinos are everywhere, and they are very hard to detect. But uh, also, most important, they could uh, hold the secret to our existence. That means why there is matter rather than nothing. So uh, of course, as a, as a theorist, I can uh, think about all these uh, big questions. But in order to, uh, I, pro I can provide explanations. But in order really to understand if my explanations make any sense, we really need technology innovation. And this means advanced accelerators and ultra-sensitive forefront detectors. Uh, at Fermilab, uh, the Fermilab Accelerator Complex is actually the largest in the US and the second largest in the world. And uh, Fermilab is leading the world in uh, superconducting magnet and radio frequency uh, technology. And this is uh, essential in accelerating particles as uh, the protons that we see moving here around this uh, circle. And here we see uh, Energy Secretary uh, Moniz visiting Fermilab and talking to accelerator scientists um, at, at my institution. Um, so uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson was made possible uh, because of these two most powerful cameras in the world, that is the ATLAS detector and the CMS detector. Uh, Chicago and Argon play a leading role in building and now operating and upgrading uh, the Atlas detector. And similar situation is for Fermilab vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, CMS, the other big detectors. These are uh, uh, six story high uh, apparatus that actually weight like the tour the Eiffel Tower, not the two Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower. So uh, <laughs> these are huge, uh, complex objects with cutting edge technology. And what they do is they take pictures of the collisions. They actually take 20,000, uh, 20 million, sorry, pictures uh, per second in three dimensions. So they are really very impressive. So uh, it took, uh, sorry, here I would like to show you um, a small movie, a cool movie, I think, about uh, how the particles uh, collide, in this case, inside the Atlas detector and uh, inside the Large Hadron Collider in, in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, let me remind you that this is the most complex, most expensive, and most ambitious machine ever built 
by mankind and by womankind too. Uh, and so uh, maybe I can, I hope I can switch. Okay, here I guess it starts. Um, so what we do is we really uh, recreate the conditions of the early universe, basically instance after the Big Bang, and in reality we create the Higgs particle. So we are now moving, crossing the frontier between France and Switzerland, and here is a proton with the quarks inside, uh, traveling basically at almost the speed of light, moving in the LHC tunnel, and arriving to the Atlas detector, and there encounters another proton coming from the other side, and kaboom, they collide, and they have a lot of energy, so they produce a lot of particles, and among those particles, they actually produce a Higgs boson that in this case is decaying to two electrons that are the green tracks here, and uh, two muons that are the blue tracks here. So we have really produced the Higgs boson, uh, as you see. So uh, actually, it took uh, half a century, thousands of people, and billions of dollars to prove this uh, beautiful idea of uh, Mr. Higgs about uh, um, an invisible field that is related closely to the Higgs boson and that explains why all particles acquire mass. Uh, it took me 25 years to be modeling this type of thing, so I'm also very happy about the discovery. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, to, be, to meet uh, Mr. Higgs at the Nobel Prize ceremony about two years ago. And uh, uh, in, on that occasion, he was telling me, as they took this picture, that his first uh, paper on the Higgs boson was rejected because it was not sufficiently interesting for physics. Uh, so, <laughs> You can see that communicating basic science can be quite challenging, even when you are doing it to, with your peers. So um, after, after the Higgs boson discovery, the next breakthrough uh, would actually be to understand the identity of dark matter. And so what distorts the images of distant galaxies? Maybe uh, if we look uh, at this uh, picture that we all know, we see that uh, the, pro the projection or the reflection of the buildings uh, is actually distorted because of the curve of the surface. Well, a similar thing happens here, but what happens is that there's matter that we cannot see, that we call dark matter, and what it does is distorts uh, space and time because of its gravitational interactions, and in such way, light is bended as it travels to us. Okay? So, uh, dark matter holds the universe together. Dark matter makes 85% of all the matter in the universe, so that's really amazing. Um, and we don't have the slightest clue what it's made of, but of course, theories uh, uh, are very inventive, so there are many uh, flourishing ideas. Uh, some of them, this is called a WIMP, Weakly Interactive Massive Particle, and was uh, uh, actually invented the, the, the concept and idea by uh, Professor Michael Turner here at the University of Chicago. I myself have been working on these ideas uh, quite a long time, and so I would be very excited if we finally uh, pin it down. Uh, but the way to pin down the existence of dark matter is again going back to ultra-sensitive uh, detectors, and Fermilab and the University of Chicago are really partnering in this hunt for the dark matter. So all these are different, four different experiments that are deep underground that are trying to detect dark matter uh, coming from space, and these are very different, uh, very different technologies, all of these, some of them quite complex, uh, and this one in particular, and my friends at, at uh, Fermilab gave me this uh, thing here. So this is the same, uh, this is a, um, a CCD, uh, as we see here. And this technology is exactly the same technology uh, that you have in your mobile phones, and that allows you to take beautiful pictures. So some of them are really simple. So, wow, I cannot break it. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, besides trying to detect the dark matter that is hitting us from space, the other thing we are doing, uh, we are actually trying to create, to manufacture the dark matter in the laboratory, the same way as we did with the Higgs boson. Uh, so again, here at the LHC, we are trying to manufacture dark matter, but although these um, detectors are super sensitive, they are not sensitive enough to see the dark matter because dark matter interacts very lightly with any particle that we know. So the idea is that what we'll see could be uh, an event of this type where we detect something going on in one side of the event and nothing going on in the other. So it's this imbalance uh, that will allow to say that this could be a detection of their matter at a lab. So uh, I would say that um, it's very hard to um, predict how our basic science with, will impact society, and I shall uh, refer to that a, a bit, but I think that particle physics has a very strong uh, track record, uh, and in fact, we see here uh, the Fermilab Tevatron, uh, and if about 30 years ago, the technology that was developed at the Fermilab Tevatron enabled the uh, industrialization of MRI medical scanners that are today allowing us to basically study the anatomy and, and, uh, of, and, and, and understand many of the diseases or the issues that are inside uh, human bodies. Uh, another. Um, very interesting example is also appear around the same time and is related uh, to these uh, protons, a beam of hope. Uh, so Fermilab scientists designed and built the first proton therapy accelerator uh, for cancer treatment and that this was actually when it was still at Fermilab and then it was sent to the Loma Linda facility. And uh, today this type of uh, least invasive type of uh, uh, cancer therapy is uh, utilized in about 50 facilities or more around the world. So uh, to conclude, uh, I would like uh, also to uh, stress the uh, relevance of uh, uh, introducing youth to the world of science. And I could say that uh, Fermilab, I'm very proud to say that I think Fermilab is doing its very strong share in that by pairing with parents and with uh, University of Chicago and with other in institutions um, in all the Chicago area. So thank you and I will be glad to take your questions. We have about five minutes for questions, so please. How does someone get started at the scale of science that you're talking about here? I mean, you know, Hunt was talking about people learning to use pipettes, but uh, they got to learn a little something more to do some of the experiments that you're talking about. What's an apprenticeship like in your field? Yeah, I, I could say I, I was actually, uh, about a week ago, I was the United Nations with Nigel, and there was a, a symposium, a one-day symposium about um, uh, CERN and uh, its global, uh, uh, you know, the global uh, model, and how to, for example, relate it to other uh, uh, global goods for humanity. And what was discussed there is related to your question: uh, is the fact that you know, for example, the Large Hadron Collider involves um, about 3,000 scientists in each of these experiments that I show, LHC and Atlas, uh, about 40 countries and uh, more than 100 or 180 institutions around the world. And uh, this is done really with very light uh, structure, unlike in any other uh, you know, industry or any other, <laughs> I think, uh, um, type of endeavor in, in, in the world. And I think the reason for that is that the scientists are just uh, um, moved by the passion of, of learning. And so, uh, although there are, are very, uh, there are basically no legal bindings, we are all working together for, in this competition and collaboration that was discussed before here, but uh, uh, in a very, I would say, healthy competition because we are just moved by trying to understand uh, this, the way the, the world works. And so I think that's the reason that <laughs> this started and have been developing and I, I you know, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing, uh, 
uh, psychological <laughs> I can imagine. effect to be studied. Please. Have you um, developed the technology such as this um, Sorry? source that is you know, used by or used for cancer therapy? Is that a process for commercialization that is more push or pull? Meaning, me, me, meaning um, do, do, does the laboratory push the technology mm -hmm. into the commercialization, or do the commercial partners pull it? Does that make sense? I, I, yeah, I think it was, uh, <laughs> this was 30 years ago, and I was not here, so I don't know <laughs> all the details. But um, uh, I was not here in Chicago, I mean. <laughs> uh, not that I'm so young. But, um, uh, but actually, um, what I want to say is that, uh, as far as I have read about this, uh, this was an idea that came you know, with uh, Robert Wilson and others at Fermilab, and they realized that this was uh, a possibility, okay, to have this proton cancer therapy instead of being as invasive as x-rays or so, where you basically hit the whole body, body in the hope of you know, hitting the cancer cells. This is much more uh, target. So they thought they could do that. And I guess they built yeah. the accelerator that proved that that can work. That was the first one. And then I think that uh, you know, that idea was uh, um, put into function at uh, the Loma Linda facility. But then afterwards, uh, the companies uh, start thinking about this and, and you know, pulling, you would say, the pulling effect that you are talking about, correct? Uh, so it's a bit of uh, how you do the intertwine between uh, basic science and, and applications uh, to society. The same thing was with MRI, correct? Fermilab actually uh, developed these uh, uh, um, superconducting wires in order to build the superconducting magnets. And then uh, the, the fact that that was made easy and, and cheaper, so to say, led uh, you know, General Electric to go to the industrialization. And then that's the reason why we now have today MRIs basically in almost or most uh, uh, hospitals in the world, correct? So it's a very, uh, it depends on the, on the situation, but it's an intertwined uh, relation between push and pull. I think there's time for one more question, so Eric's getting it. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, a, I'm a materials physicist, so I'm interested in a materials question. So it's, it's amazing that you think about creating this dark matter in the laboratory, right? Most of this is, it's all out there in the universe. Um, and so there are two approaches. You can look into the universe and see the, matter, the ma mass or matter out there. You try to create in the lab. How will you actually know you've created the same thing in the lab at CERN that you have out in the universe? <laughs> that's, a, a, that's a great question. I'm very thankful because for that you need theorists. <laughs> <laughs> so that justifies my existence. <laughs> Yeah, basically, you know, you have a model, correct? And uh, uh, if you detect this uh, type of events I show at LHC, would you believe that you have detected that matter? No, no, okay? It would fit my, mo my model, maybe. I will tweak my model till it fits, okay? Because that's what I'm paid for. Uh, but, but then, you know, then I know, I mean, you know, science is very rigorous. Then I know that if that, if that model explains what I see at LHC and fits with the dark matter explanation, then I should be able, uh, by the same token, to go to these experiments deep underground, and the dark matter that is hitting us should also behave in a way that my model predicts. So in, in, in this, so we are putting the piece, pieces together, correct? And, and really, the theorists are actually useful. Thank you very much, Marcelo.